1 Timothy 1 and Revelation 18. So we're going to continue off in our intermediate discipleship class on world history. Uh, last time I've talked about the rising Catholic powers, and it was due to Spain and Portugal. And it's hitting off where Spain and Portugal's power is increasing because of their exploration of the New World. The Catholic Empire, the reason why it became so powerful is thanks to Spain and Portugal's endeavors, and Spain and Portugal, how they became so powerful is because of the exploration of the New World. But I want to cover an extremely important topic that was that is very significant to the Catholic power. The reason why the Catholic Empire is able to become rich, increase in its civilization and its might is because of page 264. If you have Frederick Widowson's book, A Bible Believer's Guide to World History, then you would know where to go. It would be page 264. It's the slave trade, the slave trade. Slavery was extremely important. That's how they were able to build its empire more strongly. Now, before you get these uh, dumb, wicked liberals harping and then crying about Protestants or the Christians who started off the slave trade and the Christian Americas who had the Civil War during the slave trade, and you got uh, some Christian-minded Southern generals, Confederates, where they demonize and they'll say that they're the ones in charge of slavery, everything. Well, to be honest, that's not how it was. Slavery went all the way back. If you recall in your Bible, world history class, where did slavery start? It started right here, Africa itself. All right? The Bible showed first mention of slavery was Ishmael's seed, the Arabs. And I've given you some explanation on that one, too, when we went all the way back to Genesis. And then not only that, if you recall, during later on in history, remember the African empire became very powerful, right? Whereas Europe, it was like crumbling to pieces. It was a horrible state during the first centuries. But Africa was rich and became powerful. And what you have to understand is because the Africans, they've been practicing slavery. All right, they've been selling off their own people. Not only that, uh, whites were doing the same thing over there during the times of the Vikings as well. This was a pretty common practice. It was a common practice that time. So before people uh, start to blame everything and few little states all the way over here, you got to realize that's not how slavery grew so much in power, okay? It's a worldwide thing. Why? It's been going on for centuries over there. And this continent, it's such a huge continent over here, it had to take something like this where it can spread to other places, okay? So you have to understand that before they start crying and blaming the Christians, uh, you can say to them, uh, no, you blame the pagans first. And not only that, the Bible, you have to understand this. The Bible, it actually condemned people kidnapping other people and selling them. They might argue that, well, the Bible has slavery back then, but the simple argument to that is this. The simple argument to that is because, well, you have to understand this was a, it's, this was a common practice that time and by the way, they don't say slavery, but today you, uh, you have different levels of peeping, people submitting to somebody else's power and people taking advantage of you. Aren't the liberals crying and whining about, you know, capital bo uh, capitalism bosses and millionaires, how they take advantage of their workers? Do, is, aren't celebrity slaves themselves <laughs> to the Hollywood system, to the whims of the people in power over there. Uh, you got to realize the Bible, it took it, they saw prisoners over there. And you got prisoners doing community work and service. You just don't call them slave because that's such a very negative word. But in the Bible, during that time, how they used their prisoners were people who were in debt and they wanted to pay off. Slavery was a common custom and practice that time. It wasn't as evil and dreadful as you think about kidnapping people and selling them because the Bible says that's illegal. The Bible condemns that. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
verse 10, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 10. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. For what? Men stealers. See that? You're stealing people. For liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. God condemns that. He totally condemns that. He is not in agreement of people. Uh, that's why he told the Jews about be, uh, don't kidnap and steal other people and sell them off amongst your own people. God truly condemned that. Actually, you got to realize this. There were people who wanted to become slaves if you read the Bible. It's not as wicked as you think. A person, there were people who wanted to remain as slaves. Why? Because too much accountability, responsibility, too much work, and it was easier to work as a slave. So God says if you wanted to be a slave that time, then you had to get your ear nailed through the wall, actually. Now, to get that, that's quite a big thing. That's a very hurtful thing. But during that time in the Bible, that's how people were dependent on that. See? And not only that, during that time, well, let's uh, go to Revelation 18, all right? Let's go to Revelation 18, 13. Revelation chapter 18. And then we'll read verse 13. The Bible points out the empire that was responsible for slavery during this time, which you don't know, but when the Europeans were involved, this was known as the Atlantic slave trade, all right? How that became the replacement of all the other slavery options is because the Catholic Empire was increasing its power. So because of that, they wanted more slaves over here. That's why the Catholic Empire became extremely powerful, and God actually condemns that Catholic Empire. Notice the Catholic Empire is infamously known for that, Revelation chapter 18, verse 13, verse 13. And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour, and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and what? Slaves and souls of men. The Roman Catholic Church and Empire is the one responsible for kicking off the Atlantic slave trade, you got to understand. All right, so that's what the historians won't tell you, okay? They just like to aim it toward the Bible Belt area of America. They always like to pick on them. But look, if you aim just for the small portion in America over here, that's not how you can get worldwide slavery that time. How they, slavery became so common and powerful is because of that Catholic empire here spreading out to the new world. That's why slavery was everywhere, you have to understand. Okay, let's... Look at the slave trade at page 264. This was an infamous period that it became a detrimental damage and hurt for centuries, and wars came out. All right. No historical subject of great importance is so burdened with controversy or so full of myths and legends as the Atlantic slave trade, but I want to tackle a summary of its beginnings here. We will be dealing with the subject of slavery over time. Uh, we'll skip down. I am using as a primary source the slave trade by Hugh Thomas, one of the byproducts, byproducts of Portuguese exploration. So the Portuguese, they were exploring America, okay? Because Spain and Portugal, they were increasing in power here. So now they're uh, exploring the Americas. As that was going on, the byproducts of Portuguese ex exploration was arrayed by Lancoret de Freitas, who attacked an Azanagi village in Africa and returned on August 8, 1444, to Portugal with 235 slaves. Though this is found in Thomas's work, Widowson is quoting. The seizure, the seizure of slaves, rather than their purchase, was in a frequent practice in both Europe and Africa. These razias, as the odious practice of man-stealing was known, were carried out throughout the Middle Ages in Spain and Africa by Muslim merchants. Oh, remember that? Uh, back, remember, where was it? To the Arabs. I told you that one at the book of Genesis, right? And Mohammed was following along with that one, the Muslims. All right, let's keep reading. And their Christian equivalents had done the same. Who are the Christian equivalents that time when the Muslims were doing it? That's the Catholics. Everyone calls Catholic Christian, but it's not Bible-believing Christians. These were Christians that, uh, these were the so-called Christians of the Catholic Empire. Okay. Muslims were justified by the Quran in seizing Christians 
and enslaving them. Remember the Crusades, how they did that with the children? That was a horrible thing. And by the way, the Catholics are the ones selling off their own people too. All right, that's horrible. That's wicked sent from hell. In their long, drawn-out reconquest of Muslim Spain had conducted themselves similarly. So the Muslims at Spain that time, but they got kicked out. But Spain continues now its practice. Slavery was not, was not new, was not a European-only institution, and was not a Catholic-only practice either. Why? Because I told you what went back over here, right? Let's keep reading. It was and is today a common practice, and it is estimated, for some of you who don't know, there are more slaves in the world, people owned by other people to varying degrees today than ever in history. I don't know if you knew that. Well, you don't hear that on the news. All you hear is, get the boot, get the boot, get the boot. And then Trump, Trump, it's all Trump's fault. They don't tell you about these pedophile cases. <laughs> they don't tell you all about these slavery cases. No, they don't do that over there. You know, well, why are their mouths so shut about that? Maybe they need them to get more in power and pretend they're hypocrites talking about dem democracy and free speech, maybe? Okay, bunch of liars, crooks. Bunch of liars and crooks. They just want your money. That's it. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, had said that mankind was divided into two groups, the masters and the slaves. Isn't that interesting? Even in Aristotle's mind, he sees only two. The Catholic Church consented in the kidnapping of people for slavery in spite of clear scriptural statements condemning such actions, which is 1 Timothy 1.10 and Revelation 18.13. Portugal secured approval from successive popes for most of their further south southward raids to secure black slaves. Okay, so we see Spain and Portugal involved, but now let's see... The papal bulls that time, okay? Let's go back to Holy Roman Empire. What did the popes do? So the popes with their bulls, which is basically their decree, all right? And you know what your Satan, uh, you know what Satan is, right? You know what your Bible says about Satan, what he is. But anyway, that's just a side note. Bible says here, uh, excuse me, not Bible, Wilson's book says here, First, in 1442, Pope Eugenius, well, he's not a genius on this, the fourth issued the bull, Elias Key, approving Prince Henry's expeditions to secure African slaves. So it started with Pope Eugenius IV. So that's how the Catholic <laughs> got their approval for slavery. The Pope granted Prince Henry exclusive rights over his African conquests. Then in the 1450s, Pope Popes Nicholas V and Calixtus III gave an even warmer approval in three more papal bulls. Whatever their intentions, the results of their actions were the approval of, as in the papal bull Dom Diversas, of Portuguese subduing Saracen, pagans, and other unbelievers alike, and even to reduce them to perpetual slavery. This excuse <coughs> of how it would be a blessing to convert these people to Catholicism to not change the wretched state of slavery. Well, of course. Some popes did express disgust at the slave trade, but their outcry was rare. Perhaps from a political point of view, the popes were doing what they thought was best in the struggle against Islam. Why? More slaves, more power, more manpower. But that's what the Muslims did too, remember? They converted these Christian slaves into Muslim converts to help their, with their wars. It's all pure wickedness. The Portuguese, like their counterparts from the Italian city of Genoa, were not only interested in slaves, but gold and opening trade routes for goods to come to Europe by way of India and China around Africa. The ultimate goal of many of the early explorers was to find a trade route to the wealth of India and China. By 1475, the Portuguese were not only bringing African slaves to Europe, but we're trading them for gold to African merchants. So notice right here that their trade route, they need India right here and then China. Through this trade route, they're able to receive a lot of rich resources, but with the slaves over here, they can start doing trading everywhere. That's how the Catholic Empire became more powerful. See that? They became more powerful through these trading. 
Let's keep reading here. On the coast of Benin in West Africa, the African tribes of Ijo and Itsekiri prospered from the slave trade with Portugal. The demand for African slaves was growing in Europe during the 1400s, particularly in Spain. <coughs> the Portuguese were very exclusionary in their monopoly of the trade and even concluded a treaty with Edward IV of England in 1481, which kept the English out of the lucrative slave trade for several generations. And that's so stupid. So notice right here that all of stupid Europe here, the Catholic countries, they were fighting each other for properties, their properties of people over here in Africa, that they were in such height and tension that they had to make a boundary to lie. No, you, well, we're going to make a treaty on you take this amount of slaves, this amount of slaves right here. So it is very wicked during that time. But see, everybody is thinking about power. If there's one thing you learned about Islam and Catholicism, it's not religion. It's power. It's power, power. That's all they think about. It's politics and power. It's political power. Okay, let's keep reading here. In 1493, Pope Alexander IV drew a line across the world, dividing it between Spain and Portugal, <laughs> which resulted in the famous Treaty of Tordesillas, which permanently divided the world between spheres of Spanish and Portuguese influence. So as Spain and Portugal were conquering the new worlds over here, that the Pope had to put a division over them because it was all everybody grabbing for power here. This was a rich time period for Europe. Let's keep reading. Christopher Columbus noticed, uh, noted that the Indians he had captured in the Caribbean did not make good slaves and didn't hold up well under hard labor like the what? Africans did. That's why... Africa was picked on for a lot for slavery. Because when they did the Native Americans, it wasn't that good. When they did the other countries and then fellow whites, it didn't work that well compared to the Africans over here. So let's keep reading off. Uh, under hard labor, like the Africans did so in 1510, King Ferdinand ordered the best and strongest available slaves to be sent to what was called the West Indies, to work in mines. So remember, Columbus discovered the West Indies over here. So then they sent the African slaves over toward this side as ca the Catholic empires were growing more in power. A priest of the day, Bar Bartolome de las Casas, had written History of the Indies accusing the Spanish colonists of murdering several million Indians through the cruelties of slavery. His claims agree with some recent historians who report a far greater native population throughout the Americas living before Columbus's arrival than previously believed. So that's how wicked the Catholic Empire is. Throughout the 1500s, the 16th century, Spain and Portugal continued to be slave countries, providing Europe and the New World of the Americas with black African and white Arabic Muslim slaves, just as African potentates and Muslim leaders used white European and black African slaves. Eventually, the balance was tilted so far in favor of black slaves that African slavery became the norm. So you notice that here. Remember, let's go uh, blast to the past. So remember, it didn't start out with Africans here, all right? That's what your schools would like to claim. It started in your Bible at the book of Genesis with the Arabs over here. They did it with the Israelites over here. And then what happened was... Africa, was that was a common practice in Africa amongst their own kinsmen. That's why Africa was very rich and powerful during the first centuries. Europe was poor and falling apart with the Black Plague. But the African Empire was powerful and rich that time because of what? Slavery as well. Then you got the Vikings during that time and then other white people selling off each other. Then what happened was Spain and Portugal, as they were increasing more in power, they already had relationships with Africans over here. So because they noticed the comparison of African slaves being more suitable for their riches and uh, building up their empire, especially when they hit the New World, Native Americans weren't fitting well in the other people. So that's why it soon transitioned and then African slavery became the norm. You see that? And as centuries passed by, it became the African slavery that time. That's how it transitioned throughout history. So let's keep reading here. For contrast, while uh, 
Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, in 1519 was granting a slaving license for 4,000 slaves to a friend. The great emperor of the African kingdom of Songhai on the Niger River was presenting a gift of 1,700 slaves to a friend of his. So notice right here, this was common that the African empire were doing that with each other. And then Europe, they were trying to buy off from these people as well. Why? Because it's all about power. You notice right here, it's not a matter of about uh, color over here or religion or oppression of minorities or anything like that. It's all about power here. Everything, every empire, they just wanted to build up power and they could care less. And that's what we see today too, unfortunately. You see these people screaming off their heads about democracy, rights of the people, and they're lying through their teeth. All they want is power. They just want to control you and use the guise of, and the deception of, we're all for equal rights and etc. No, you just want more money. You just want more money. I told you about one example about the Ferguson riot people against the Black Lives Matter people. The Ferguson riot founder people, they got angry at the Black Lives Matter founder people for getting millions of dollars, and the Ferguson riot people said, no, that money is ours. See, all of it is just money, money, money. See? All right, let's keep reading right here. Everybody wants money. The trans-Saharan slave trade, so right here, right, the trans-Saharan slave trade, remember that was common during the early centuries, before the Atlantic slave trade. But then what happened? It was the big trafficking route throughout the 16th century until the Atlantic trade to the Americas began to promise more cash rewards. Why? Because they get more new resources over here now. They can take advantage of the weaker populaces over here. So that's why the trans-Saharan slave trade switched to the Atlantic tra slave trade, which is why the Africans ended up into that mess about the Atlantic slave trade. Because that's, uh, it all started where the Catholic Empire started to trade route with the Muslims and then the people in Africa. Until 5050, Europe was the biggest purchaser of slaves. And then it transitioned after that with the massive planting of sugar cane in the Spanish Empire of the Americas, the New World became the destination for, uh, for many more unhappy Africans. As the 16th century drew to a close, there were more voices expressed in opposition of slavery, but African slavery had become too entrenched and accepted as a cultural norm throughout Catholic countries as it has always been in Islamic countries that there seemed to be no turning back. By the 1500s, the slave trade had been internationalized with England, France, and the Dutch involved as well. That's how it happened. So that's the origins of slavery. Okay, let's go to the Renaissance here, the Renaissance. Look at page 268. Page 268. All right, so let's, so let's see one by one how the Catholic Empire increased. So now that they've got the slavery and then the exploration with new natural resources, the empire becomes powerful, right? So then obviously their education, their thinking, their artworks, their writings would become more powerful. That's the same thing with the American state, see? They grow in power through the, its uh, rich beginnings, and then what happens? The higher education, secular humanism is sought after, and then they become wise in their own conceits. See, what men learn from history is that men never learn from history, all right? Look how smart our world is. You think they're so smart right now? No, man, I keep telling you, with this... Uh, with the virus that spread out, look how their latest science and technology helped you out. You all have to scrounge around for toilet paper again. Now you only can take one paper towel with you. Some markets are doing that again. Look how advanced our technology is. Wow. Stupid, idiotic people. Don't make me preach hard against these idiots again of today. Renaissance is typical secular humanism, what you see in liberal universities today too. So let me read it. All right, now let's go on to a period of time which the Italians of the era be, between 1378 and 1464 called La Rinascita. So right here, the Renaissance, another word for the Renaissance. 
or rebirth. It means like to be rebirthed, kind of like born again, right? That's the idea. But it's not born again, it's being damned again, to be honest. Because it seemed to them to be a triumphant resurrection of the spirit of the classical era of Roman and Greek history after a barbarous interruption of a thousand years. We call it the period of the Renaissance. It took more than a revival antiquity. Durant tells us in his fifth volume of the story of civilization entitled The Renaissance, it took a lot of money. Where do you get that money from? Remember what they were doing? The slavery and then the exploration of rich resources. The funds of merchants, bankers, the church, and fortunes made on slavery and the theft of gold from technologically backward and politically disorganized cultures were necessary to buy the manuscripts that revived a love of pagan antiquity, just like today. You've seen these science labs and then these schools spending, what, uh, thousands to millions of dollars for a certain artifact that is so important in our culture and in our education. It's just stupid, man. Amen. The secularization of the growing middle classes of Europe, the growth of universities, which invited skepticism and a disdain for the supernatural world of religion and a larger acquaintance with the world, doesn't that sound like today's society? That's what the Renaissance is. It's a revival of today's paganism, 2021 paganism. <laughs> That's what it is. It first took hold in Florence, Italy. So it's right there, Florence, Italy, all right? That's where it first got into. And then what got involved, which along with Venice was the richest city in Italy. So then it hit toward here. Okay. Art was Florence's passion at this time. Patronage of art was a way of gaining status and power for wealthy merchant families. So it's through these arts, that's why the wealthy became even more powerful. The, Med the Medicis were one of the, those wealthy and powerful families, okay? They were the ones promoting the arts. The Borgias, what you're going to find out from these people is that they were evil people, okay? So let me just keep reading on. The flow of manuscripts from uh, beleaguered then conquered Byzantium were not all religious. There were great many secular works which found their way to Western Europe. The Medicis became known as patrons of the arts just as the Borgia family became known as ruthless politicians and power seekers. All right, so the stark difference with these two families. One was promoting the arts, one was uh, seeking after power. The Greek philosopher Protagoras had said that man is the measure of all things, which is in direct contradiction with the Bible's clear statements that the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. is the measure of all things. Amen. This philosophy is called humanism, and it was the prevailing religion of the Renaissance. The idea that somehow mankind was this magnificent creature who is going to create a perfect world all on his own without a god or gods involved. Although many of the humanists were also deeply religious, there is a great strain of atheism and glorification of man as the ultimate example of nature's perfection in the Renaissance. You want, a, you want an example of this? Santa Clara University. That's a great example. Or Catholic Catholic like Florence, right? Like Italy. Catholic Catholic, religious in background, but oh no, they have this uh, empathy, this side, where they promote a lot about glorification of man and even skepticism and atheism. N not much different. We didn't learn anything from back then. These are the same idiots in 2021 in your schools that were poking fun at these people at the Renaissance. And these were the same idiots in the Renaissance that were poking fun of uh, people 200 years behind them. Guess what? When, if we do hit 2041, those are going to be the same teachers that are going to poke fun at your 2021 professors. Trust me, if you trust your professors, then you got rotten, bra you got rotten brains. You don't learn from history, man. Amen. Yeah, if there's something you want to depend on, it's this ancient book. Amen. That never changed for the past 6,000 years, man. 
And you trust man. You're so stupid for trusting in man. You know why you trust man so much? You trust yourself so much. That's why. You trust yourself a lot. You think that your thoughts, your feelings, and everything is so dependable. You can't trust anybody. I'm going to do whatever I want. That's a fleshly, selfish, pompous idiocy. Just no different from Stalin and Hitler. I'm going to do whatever I want. Nothing more different from that. You all just have different ways of doing it. All right, I can't spend time kicking mankind. All right, I got to keep reading here. One of the arts and sciences that were profoundly affected by the Renaissance were architecture with the majesty of the Gothic cathedral, replaced by the mixture of classical and Gothic architecture of Filippo Brunelleschi. Other major artists of the Renaissance, so we got Brunelleschi, and then Leonardo da Vinci, not only an artist, but da Vinci, what is interesting about him, for some of you who didn't know, an inventor and far ahead of his time, in particular with military science. And by the way, some of the Catholic uh, kingdoms, they used his military tactics, da Vinci's inventions, to increase their power. For some of you who didn't know that. He not only painted memor uh, memorable masterpieces such as the Mona Lisa, obviously, and the Last Supper, which we know, but also explored everything from flying machines to eyeglasses, designing things far ahead of his time, like armored tanks and helicopters even. How about that? Another great artist of this period was Michelangelo, who is famous for his statue of David, and painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Maybe we should do that with our new church building. It's a dispensational chart, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. One of the periods... That sounds tempting, but anyway. One of the period's great sculptors was named Ghiberti. Another was named Donatello. And another was Luca della Robbia. In painting some of the most famous names were Masaccio, Raphael, and Titian, along with Fra Angelico. Artists and scholars were lured, lured to Florence by the patronage of the wealthy Medicis, right? These guys right here. And others of wealth. A group who met with Lorenzo Medici formed the Pla Plata uh, Platonic, uh, Platonic yep, Academy to study pagan Greek philosophy. So notice that they're trying to revive the philosophical pagan system all the way back over here, all right? Just like your today's education system is doing, right? Nothing different. Often, like Origen and Philo, men of the Catholic faith would attempt to combine Plato and Christ, making one understandable to themselves and those like-minded by the words of the other. The Hebrew occultic study of the Kabbalah became popular much as it is today among some celebrities. How about that? Not much different from back then. The Borgias, all right, this is the family you want to know, were a ruthless and brutal political family that began its ascent to power with Rodrigo Borgia, who, moving from Spain, had changed the spelling of his name from Borgias, the family of Pope Calixtus III, so he came from a family lineage of popes. He became a cardinal and then spreading the wealth of his family around liberally in the College of Cardinals, he bought his way to being Pope Alexander VI in 1492. I mean, that's your head of the Catholic Church, all right? That's how you can trust these people. <laughs> Corrupt people, huh? His purchase of the Papacy was a pagan beginning for a pagan pope, says Durant. He was a wily politician and even allied himself with a Turkish sultan against his enemies. He was known for promoting relatives to positions of influence and power. He sold offices, took over the estates of dead cardinals, and sold dispensations and divorces to make money. This was a corrupt pope. From the Borgia's line. He had taken, look at this, the, the corruption gets worse. He had taken a married woman as a lover, a married woman as a lover, 
when only a priest and she bore him four children. This scandal just gets better and better, don't it? When he began to set his sights on the papacy, he found her a husband, and she was twice widowed, dying at the age of 76 and leaving her wealth to the church. All right, now, <laughs> look what happens here. Alexander, so the pope, this corrupt pope's oldest son, Caesar Borgia, became a cardinal and fighting for the papal states against their enemies, he even used one of Leonardo da Vinci's war machines and became the most powerful man in Italy. All right, so the pope's offspring, Caesar, he used Leonardo da Vinci's war machine and then grew, uh, built up his power through that. So let's see if this guy's any better. Well, it sounds like a blood, uh, powerful, bloodthirsty individual. He had a reputation for bloodthirsty cruelty as well. Well, no surprise. Once he released several convicted prisoners and shot each of them with arrows for sport, just for fun. He was just doing that. Caesar's sister, Lucretia, who lived until 1519, was also an infamous member of the Borgia family. Their family name has come down to us as consistent with treachery, deceit, murder, and political betrayal. Alexander eventually died in 1503 of what some call malaria, but what others have said was, now this is funny, all right, was the result of an, an, an attempt, so his attempt, to poison a cardinal that backfired with Alexander consuming his own poison. Yes, you may laugh, all right? I have no sympathy for a wicked man like that. Serves him right. So that's the infamous Borgia family during the time of the Renaissance. We covered the artists, Medici's, Borgia's, Machiavelli, all right? One of the Renaissance's most interesting characters and the owner of the name, where we get the word, Machiavellian, from was Niccolo Machiavelli, who lived from 1469 to 1527. He was the son of a Florentine lawyer who became a politician, a philosopher, and an author writing books on politics that still affect our political world today, including The Prince and the Art of War. As a political philosopher, he admired lying, treachery, deceit, and almost every kind of wicked design a leader could concoct to achieve his ends. Why? Because of his famous belief, the ends justify the means. Now that's a wicked quote. You know why? The Jesuits took that quote later on for themselves. That's a wicked quote. Has been a battle cry of many of our most recent politicians in American history, much to our shame. Yeah, amen. Amen to that one. They always justify what they, their means because of the end. The end result, what they always say. You see that in the stinking news media all the time. Look at the end, the, the end. It justifies what we do, blah, 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 blah. Always do that. Durant says that he represented the ultimate challenge of a revived paganism against a weakened Christianity. That's what Machiavelli was known for. Which, of course, he should have said Catholic Christianity. Yeah. Machiavelli is on almost everyone's list of histories, most influential people, and much admired by the world today. Eventually, the Renaissance, so loved by humanists everywhere as a time of great glory and awakening for their godless pipe dreams, came to a gradual end. Guess what? It's going to happen right now, all right? All what you learned in your degrees, your diplomas, what you're working so hard for, and learning all those credit hours in those schools, it's all going to go down. Watch. Give it time. All turns to dust. All right, the glory of man with their great education and everything. Its anti-scriptural dream lives on in most of today's universities and colleges as the doctrines of secular humanism have even crept into Protestant and evangelical Christian education and practice in present-day America. Absolutely right. A good example, don't get mad at me, a great example is R.C. Sproul. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. I read his book on philosophy. He's trying to revive the, those Catholic philosophers. 
And he goes back to the Greek philosophers. That's how he based his whole argument of theology and everything. You see all this? See all this? Not much different. A revival of secular humanism stuff. All right. While the Bible says that mankind is basically wicked and in need of the Savior, humanism teaches that people are basically good, no Savior necessary. The Renaissance at its, at its essence was an exercise in humanistic self-adoration. That's your glor glorious Renaissance, all right? Not much to think about them, right? Okay, we're going to come now to the exploration. We come to here now. Okay, we talked a lot about this area here, but now let's see the action here. Remember, I told you some stuff about what happened, about possible uh, activities of the sons of God over here, right? And then the pagans and the tribal people who came out after that, now this civilization is coming over here. So because of that, you're not going to see much sons of God activity now. Now the humans are spreading out over here. But there are some interesting things, okay? Because there was a lot of mythological things that the explorers wanted to find here. They wanted to find the fable fountain of youth and then gold and a lot of other things that they heard about over here. And how that come about? It came about because if those sons of God went over here, that would make a lot of sense what they were able to treasure up, what they were able, able to build, right? Talked about the Mayan civilization and everything over here. A lot of interesting things, okay? And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it too. But first, let's talk about the explorers, okay? Let's talk about what they discovered. Page 259 in Widowson's book, page 259. A third factor was exploration and colonization of lands around the world, which allowed for the spread of Christianity to distant lands. So why Christianity was able to spread out, uh, to be more honest, it was Catholicism. Catholicism that spread out. But the Christians who broke out from the Catholic Church, they were able to travel here and spread it out eventually. But we'll come to that. That's a different story. Anyway, reading on, how did the exploration start? It started with China, actually. Not Europe. All right? It was China. In 1402, Emperor Yonglo of China's Ming Dynasty encouraged overseas exploration and conquest. And as Admiral Cheng Ho's fleet sailed as far west as the Red Sea over here, visiting Mecca and Egypt as well as Indonesia, Malaya, and Sri Lanka. But this exploration was not capitalized on or exploited. See, China was way ahead, but they didn't, they didn't capitalize or exploit it. These guys got the power. They got the manpower, the resources power, education power, everything. So they're able to do it. So let's see what they do. At about the same time in 1418, Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, that's an important name. He's the one that kicked it off for the Europeans. It was Portugal, all right? It was Portugal that started it. Opened an observatory and school for navigation at Sagres on Cape St. Vincent, Portugal. His goal was to find a way around Africa. So that's what he wanted to do. Go around Africa here. In order to touch base with the rich trade of China. Okay? That's what they wanted to do over here originally. The same year Portuguese navigators rediscovered Madeira, 360 miles directly west of Morocco and 540 miles southwest of Lisbon, the capital of Portugal. They had been discovered by the Romans and called the Purple Islands. In 1427, Portuguese navigator Diogo de Sevilha discovered the Azores, an island chain 700 miles west of Portugal. By Prince Henry's death in 1460, Portuguese explorers have sailed down the coast of Africa all the way to present-day Gamba. In 1487, Bartholomew Diaz, that's the next important name right here. I didn't write his name, but Bartholomew Diaz is another important name that you should know concerning about the explorers. Let's keep reading here. Uh, discovers the Cape of Good Hope, the southernmost tip of Africa for Portugal. At the same time, King John II of Portugal, Prince Henry's 
grandnephew organizes an expedition through the Mediterranean and the Red Sea under the leadership of Peru da Covilla. On October 12, 1492, Italian mariner Christopher Columbus leading a fleet of three ships. Now, Christopher Columbus is probably the most famous name. That's where we start with America over here. Fleet of three ships from Spain. So now Spain gets involved, right? Portugal was leading away, now Spain gets involved. Becomes the first European since the Vikings to reach the Americas. Because remember, the Vikings were the ones that likely reached America. I taught you that last time. Which we know of. Unlike the Vikings, he will open the Americas up to exploration and colonization. Basque fishermen had been fishing off the Grand Banks off Newfoundland for, uh, Newfoundland for a long time, but no effort had been made to explore inland, except possibly for a mention of a land called Bacalao, or the land of codfish, in some writings. Columbus's second voyage left Cadiz, Spain, in 1493, with 17 ships to explore Dominica, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Jamaica. So Columbus went again over here. So he was concentrating on this region, you'll notice, right? So that's where Columbus was going more and more. So he took a second trip there. On a side note, as this was happening, a great syphilis epidemic began to sweep Europe with those infected ordered to leave the city of Paris or be thrown into the Seine River. Well, happy times, right? In 1497, Italian navigator Amerigo Vespucci, exploring some of the coast of land touched by Columbus, declares that this land is not Asia, but a new world. America is named after him, this guy. That's where you get the name America from. In the same year, Italian mariner Giovanni Cabot, sailing for the English, English, reaches Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. He becomes the first European since the Vikings to reach the mainland of North America. So now Cabot becomes the one that was the first to reach the mainland of North America. Vespucci was the one who claimed the name. Christopher Columbus was the one that hit, hit the first in the Americas, okay? Let's see here. Also in the same year, Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama becomes the first European to round the Cape of Good Hope, all right, and goes on to India. Columbus's third voyage takes place the next year, so Columbus takes a third trip now. The genie is now out of the bottle, so to speak, and events are racing forward to Europe's conquest of the world. All right, so what happens is Spain, Portugal, the Europeans send more explorers. And as they send more explorers, they try to find more mythical things there, mythical treasures. As they delve into that, the famous empire where the Mayans and then all the other people, their timeline was falling apart in their glory, what came out next? We discuss the famous Inca Empire. This is where we get into some of the interesting stuff about the powerful Inca Empire and some of the sons of possible, some pagan or maybe sons of God activity until the explorers came and took it over. So the Inca Empire would probably be the last that you would see any trace or route of some sons of God activity. Let's talk about this mysterious Inca empire and more of the explorers in our next discipleship Bible study. Let's close with the word of prayer. Father God, I pray that um, today's history lesson has made us learn more about the nature, the tendency of mankind, and not to repeat the pattern or the footsteps of what mankind has gone through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.